Aloha nui kako. mahalo for joining us. If you're here with us for the first time, please connect with us. Whether through prayer, personal Bible study, or joining in a HANA group, you can submit that connection card down below to help us help you grow in God. Right on. That said, let's pause to pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for today. We're grateful for the day you've given us and for allowing us to be here together virtually to worship you, to hear from your word, and to focus on Jesus. God, may your spirit move through each and every one of us in our hearts and our minds to be open to what you have to tell us today. Be with us, Lord, and may you be praised in this time. Thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, last week, Jackson did a great job of wrapping up our series on freedom, looking at God's vision for His people with the Ten Commandments. You know, we talked about how if we choose to obey God's commands, then we'll experience freedom. You know, we also heard from Sana and Hannah Chang about their view of the Kingdom of God and what it means to them. Sana mentioned that the Kingdom of God means real relationships. And for Hannah, it's about a community built on Jesus Christ. And then Jackson threw us a bone about our new series on mission, which we're starting today. And I want to say, I'm glad you're here with us this morning because it means you're seeking God. And trust me on this one, God is seeking you too. This has been true for me in my life. You know, when I was about to go to college, I asked God to revive my relationship with Him and send people to help me with that. To make a long story short, God did. He sent two people, Brad and Chris, during the summer before my sophomore year of college, and they invited me to a Bible discussion. I was apprehensive at first, but I ended up going. And keep in mind, yeah, this is a discussion. I'm supposed to talk. I never. I didn't talk at all because my heart wasn't there. Regardless, after our time, Brad showed interest in getting to know me and what I like to do. So what did we do? We went hiking at Mano Falls and we just hang out. We probably got food after too because you know me, I get hungry a lot. Anyways, from, from there, Brad invited me to church services and I was skeptical, but I noticed there was a group of people my age that were there too, which made me feel more comfortable. And after attending a few services, meeting different people, I chose to get to know God more through personal Bible study. Fast forward several months later, I chose to repent and be baptized, and now I'm here. So, if you're here this morning, I'm glad. Because it either means you're seeking God, or God's seeking you, or both. And today may be the start to a forever changed life for you. More so why I'm sharing this, this is what we're going to be talking about today. As we kick off our On Mission series, we'll discover the heart of God. We'll see what the mission is, see God's heart throughout the Bible, learn what it means for us to be on mission, and end with why it's important for us to be on mission. Now I want to ask you guys something. Have you ever planned to go to a restaurant that was closed when you got there? You know, this happened to me and Makana on Valentine's Day this year. Makana being Makana, wanted Hawaiian food. So we tried to go to Highway Inn in Kaka'ako. When we got there, it was closed for some sort of uh, filming. Uh, I don't know if they were filming a commercial or something for their online presence, but it was closed. And man, I, I felt frustrated. I felt disappointed and even worried, like, thinking like, okay, what are we going to do now? Well, we decided to go to Moku Kitchen right next door, and it was a great time. But... It wasn't what we wanted originally. It wasn't the original plan. Regardless, we still made something good out of it. And there have been many instances that you may have experienced in which there was a plan. It didn't work out, but you still made something good out of it. 
In short, this is the biblical story. God had a plan, we messed up that plan, and God made something good out of it. The pattern repeats itself over and over again in the Bible. But before we get into that, let's see what Jesus defines the mission as. Open your Bibles to Matthew 28. In Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, we see an interaction between Jesus and his disciples shortly after the empty tomb, shortly after he rose from the dead. God says in Matthew 28, verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the mission, straight from the mouth of the Son of God, that we make disciples of all nations. See, at this point, Jesus' disciples knew, or at least saw, what it meant to make disciples. They witnessed Jesus do ministry and preach the good news of the kingdom of God. But earlier on in Matthew 10, Jesus tells his disciples to go to the lost sheep of Israel, not to the Gentiles. Not yet. But here in Matthew 28, Jesus says to make disciples of all nations. In other words, tell everybody. Tell the world. Open invite. Come to the party. I don't care who shows up. Just tell everybody. And what this command looks like is to go, to baptize, and to teach. That's what Jesus says. Was this the same as God's plan from the very beginning? Was it different? For me, I mean, I say no, not really. But let's look at that together. In the beginning, God created everything, including us. He created us in His image, and it was very good. In the garden, God gave humans the choice of obeying God's definition of right and wrong, or to define right and wrong for themselves. And we know what happened, right? Adam and Eve chose to define right and wrong for themselves, and that's in Genesis 3. Since that point, God's heart, thinking about on mission, has always been to redeem and restore and save his people. And he initiated that plan through Abraham and his family in Genesis 12. Through the lineage of Abraham, God's plan starts to unravel, but humans choose to do evil, yet God turns it into good in Genesis 50. Then the people of Abraham's lineage, the Israelites, go into severe oppression by the Egyptians, and God chooses Moses to free his people from slavery under Egypt in Exodus 3. God accomplishes this and initiates a covenant with the Israelites at Mount Sinai for Israel to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a representation of God to the rest of the world. Sounds pretty familiar to what Jesus was trying to do, if you ask me. The plan then is to head into the promised land of Canaan. The Israelites, however, complain and want to go back to Egypt, right? Because of the Israelites' sin, a journey that was supposed to only take about two weeks takes about 40 years. The 12 spies then scout out Canaan. 10 come back saying, hey, no can, we cannot go into this land. But the other two spies out of the 12 say, can, hikino. But this lack of faith in God extended the journey and ended up killing off a a whole unbelieving generation in Numbers 14, 34. So a whole new generation rises up in Joshua and Caleb who do lead Israel into the promised land. The charge from Joshua at the end of his life was to choose who you'll serve. That's Joshua 24, verse 14 and 15. After this comes comes Judges, and in this book, Israel goes through a constant cycle of abandoning God to being invaded, to crying out to God for help, to God rescuing them through different judges, of which Samuel is the last. Already at this point in the story, We see how God has been on mission to save us from ourselves. He's worked so hard to make good out of our evil. 
Let's keep going. After this, Israel saw all the other nations around them and realized they have kings that rule over them. So what do they say? They desire to be like everyone else around them and ask for a king. Yeah, that went nowhere. But Saul chased after and tried to kill David. This Saul was the first king, one of the first kings of Israel. But he spends most of his life chasing after David and trying to kill him, who eventually becomes the next king in 1 Samuel 19. David defeated Goliath and did some other good things, but also committed a lot, a lot of sin. 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Then comes Solomon, who built the temple in Jerusalem, but he marries so many women who believe in other gods, and he allows them to worship their gods, which brought great downfall to Israel. Eventually, Israel splitting into two kingdoms and warring against each other. Each kingdom gets handed over to two other kingdoms. The northern kingdom of Israel to the Assyrians and the southern kingdom of, of Judah to the Babylonians. Then what happens is the Jews are dispersed throughout the known world. The Medes and the Persians combine together and their king Cyrus lets a remnant of Israelites return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And that's what we find in Ezra and Nehemiah. And God works through Nehemiah and others to rebuild the temple and the walls around Jerusalem. And then comes the intertestamental period, the time between the Old and the New Testament. After that comes Jesus in the New Testament. God chose John the Baptist and his parents, and Jesus and his parents, to bring salvation to everyone, not just Israel. Jesus starts his ministry introducing the good news, the kingdom of God. And Jesus ushers in this new kingdom, not a physical one, but one of the heart. Not a kingdom of overthrowing power, but one of humble servitude. Jesus invites others to follow him, to make him Lord, and to be obedient to his dominion and rule in their lives. If they do, there will be eternal life. And Jesus' followers after the cross are commissioned to make disciples of Jesus of all nations. You see, God has been hard at work for all of humanity and for you and me. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you glad? God hasn't given up once. He hasn't been unfaithful once. God has kept his end of the bargain, per se. In the past, for God's plan of redemption and restoration, he's chosen people to work with to turn our evil choices into something good, to save his people from their sinful choices and their consequences. And now, as God's family today, we're being called to do the same, to make disciples of Jesus, to work with God, to work with Jesus, to work with the Holy Spirit, to help save others. This is the heart of God, to, to save us, to redeem us, and to restore us. So God has been on mission this whole time. What does being on mission mean for us? Here's what I've come up with, and then we'll be inspired by Jesus' example. Being on mission means to adopt the heart of God in saving the world, simply put. What else? Being on mission means that we must change the way we view our lives and others around us. Our lives are not for our own plan or desires, but for God's. Living a life for God is much more fulfilling than living a life for self. For those around us, our view becomes less about our perception of them or even us liking them and more of their knowing God or not. Being on mission means we have a new focus in this life, which is to know God and to help others know Him. Being on mission means being ready, being ready to love and serve those around us regardless of who they are. It becomes less of who is my neighbor and more of how can I become a better neighbor. Being on mission means being grateful and joyful for God's pursuit of your and my soul. That's what being on mission means to me. But let's take a look at Jesus' example. I love his example that he set in his ministry during his time on earth. You know, at the very start of his ministry, he prayed. During his ministry, he prayed. And at the end of his ministry, he also prayed. 
Let's see one of Jesus' prayers during his ministry in John 17. In verse 1 it says, After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give you eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And we'll stop there. You see, Jesus started by praying. And he started by praying for himself. He mentioned a few things that should be highlighted, I think. Bringing glory to the Father. Act of giving. Knowing. Knowing God. Knowing Jesus. Being sent. And lastly, finishing the work that he was sent to do. Jesus' example is awesome. Let's keep reading. In verse 6 it says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. Verse 13, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, and your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Wow, there's a lot here that I could point out. There's a lot here that we could learn and glean from Jesus' example but also what he prays for. In this part of his prayer in chapter 17 of the book of John, Jesus prayed for his disciples. He mentioned them accepting, believing, and obeying God's word. He mentioned how his disciples know God and know Jesus. There's that theme again of knowing. He mentioned oneness amongst the disciples, that they would experience joy, that they're not of this world. He prayed for protection. He mentioned that he sent the disciples into the world just as God sent him. And lastly, at the very end of Jesus' prayer, Jesus prayed for the rest of the world. Let's keep reading on in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known 
in order that they, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. What do we notice here? At the end of it all, Jesus prayed for those who would believe in God and in Jesus through the disciples. The themes that show up again include oneness and unity, being sent, knowing God and Jesus, and also giving. Straight from the mouth of Jesus, this is what being on mission means for us. Being sent to glorify God as a unified people by helping others know who God and Jesus are. I'm going to say that again. This is what being on mission means for us today. Being sent to glorify God as a unified people by helping others know who God and Jesus are. So as we wind down, guys, why is this mission or being on mission important? Let me share a story with you about a local business owner and why their being on mission is important. Not necessarily in the same context, but in their context. And this story is from Hawaii Business Magazine, interviewing the current business owner of Sumida Farms. If you've never heard of Sumida Farms, it's the big watercress farm by Pearl Ridge, right off of Kamehameha Highway. You might have seen it on the way to St. Timothy's. Uh, but anyways, the story starts by highlighting a key moment in the farm's history. Very sad. In 2020, the farm's leader, Auntie Barbara Sumida, was diagnosed with brain cancer. So, Auntie Barbara's niece, Emmy Suzuki, steps in with her husband to run the farm, becoming the fourth generation farm leaders. Emmy said, There is a very real possibility that the farm might not continue in any form if someone didn't step up to help manage it. So, we raised our hands. Wow, what an amazing response to a huge responsibility. And here's where we start to read about why it's important for this family to be on mission for Suzuki Farms. Emmy says, I stand on the shoulders of three previous generations who worked so hard and sacrificed so much. It's the history of the farm and the reputation that previous generations established and the integrity that they've run this, this business with. That's a huge component of what's allowed us to get through the pandemic. We have the absolute best employees in the world. Our field workers showed up. Rain, heat, a pandemic, shutdowns, whatever it was, they showed up. She says the farm has been able to increase wages and benefits for workers, invest in infrastructure, and even hire more people. And she says she hopes to continue to grow the business, maybe even beyond agriculture. Brah! Amazing! You see, there is a plan for Auntie Barbara to continue running the farm for about another nine years. But in 2020, Auntie Barbara was diagnosed with brain cancer. The plan wasn't going as expected, but something good came from it. A new generation of leaders has risen up. As a result, the farm is running, people are getting paid, and the business is growing. But here's the key. Here's the key. Emmy remembered the hard work, the integrity, and the sacrifice of previous generations. In view of all that, looking at all that, she and her husband stepped up to run the farm. Yes, for the company's sake, yes, for the reputation of the farm, but more so to honor Auntie Barbara and help others through the farm. And guys, it's the same for us being on mission for God. You and I must remember the hard work, the integrity, and the sacrifice of God and others who have come before us. In view of all that, looking at that, we must step up to be on mission for God, to help others through our relationship with God. My point today is simple. Adopt God's heart. Adopt the heart of God in view of what God has done for you. How? Well, I think we're going to discover that over the next several weeks as we journey through on mission talking about hospitality, representing the church to the community, being agents of grace, different aspects of being on mission. But here's what you can do today. Pray Jesus' prayer in John 17. Pray for yourself, 
pray for other disciples and the rest of the world. Dedicate just 10 minutes each day this week to do this. I think we're going to be amazed how our hearts change and align with God. And I think we will all be amazed at what God will do through us as we come out of this pandemic to re-engage as a church to be on mission. Adopt God's heart this week. Aloha. Before you go, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can also follow us on social media and find the link to our connection card down in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye!